let's go ahead and talk uh, as far as we're, you know, less than 24 hours away from the primary here. Are things pretty much locked in for the candidates, uh, especially in the, in the primary here in Alabama? I really think so. I don't think you see any surprises tomorrow. I think that uh, Trump will carry Alabama between 35 and 40 percent, and Rubio and Cruz will be fighting at around 20 percent. It's almost be a parallel to the other southern states and almost a carbon copy of what happened in South Carolina, in my opinion. I think I think the hay is pretty much in the barn that Trump is on a rampage and he's just gonna do well throughout the South. He he uh, really fits the mold of Southern political characters. You know, the South's had political characters throughout the years. Uh, the Longs in Louisiana, the Talmages in Georgia, we had Big Jim Foltzman, George Wallace. Trump's kind of an entertainer, so we like our politicians to be entertainers, so he's going to do well in the South. I think the only state he may not carry uh, on Tuesday would be Texas, Cruz's home state, and uh, he'll do well in Texas. <coughs> um, how big was the endorsement by Jeff Sessions? You know, actually, Sessions is a very, very popular senator here in Alabama. He's popular nationwide. He's, he's uh, one of the most conservative members of the United States Senate, so his endorsement was big nationwide. Historically in Alabama, uh, endorsements have not carried any weight. Uh, you can't translate your vote to somebody else in Alabama. It's a strange thing about Alabama politics. I don't think uh, that Trump needed Sessions endorsement in the state. I, thought, I think he's going to be flirting with 40 percent anyway. It may help some, but people somewhat sometimes resent other people getting other people's races. <coughs> you see... Um Chris Christie coming out, Jeff Sessions endorsing. Is is this a political move to sort of put themselves in a position to either become the second name on a Trump ticket or to find themselves in a favorable position in a cabinet? I don't know that they're, they're looking at it self-serving or not. I think that they see the trains left the station, though, and they may have been sitting on the sidelines saying, let's see how long this thing can go on. But when the vote is counted tomorrow night in Alabama and the other uh, 12 to 15 states who are holding primaries in this Super Tuesday primary, the number's going to be staggering, and they're going to wake up Wednesday morning and see that Trump, Trump's train may have left the station. <coughs> um, look at the other side of the coin on this. Uh, Hillary Clinton in town over the weekend. Um, how important is a state like Alabama to Hillary Clinton, not just on a Super Tuesday, but in moving ahead toward the general election in November. Well, you know, uh, it's, she's run a beautiful campaign here in Alabama. She's, uh, the traditional Democratic voters like the Clintons, so they will do extremely well. She'll do extremely well here tomorrow. She'll get 75% of the vote in the Democratic primary because uh, the majority of Democratic voters in Alabama are African American, mm -hmm. and therefore they're going to be for Hillary Clinton. They've shown that in South Carolina. And that'll be the case throughout the Southeast. Now, going forward, I don't think that Alabama is in play in a presidential election. I think that this covey of candidates we've seen come in here the last few days, we won't see them again. We won't see Trump or Hillary again because it's pretty much, pretty much foregone conclusion that Alabama is a Republican state. Mm -hmm. So if Donald Trump's a nominee or Donald Duck is a nominee, the Republicans going to carry Alabama, so we may have seen our last part of our candidates. <laughs> uh, and just a little <clears throat> bit on that, I mean, obviously Alabama choosing to move the primary up, does it, you know, just the amount of pe times the candidates have been through the state, you know, obviously that has to be, as, an, as a voter in Alabama, make you feel a little bit more courted. Well, it is, and it's been good. It's, it's a positive thing that we moved to the March 1st primary instead of being way back in June when the, when the uh, nomination was already sewn up. That's, it's a good move. We could have done a little better by making it March 8th because we're in the covey of about 10 states and we're getting overshadowed more than I thought we would by the larger states like Texas and Virginia and states like that that are more peripheral states. Mm -hmm. If indeed we'd moved to March 8th, we would have been alone by ourselves, just us in Mississippi between the Florida primary, we'd have seen a, a lot more candidates. So in hindsight, we could have done more because uh, this thing is going to continue to March 15th. Uh, let's look statewide here. Um, Senator Shelby running for re-election. 
does he need to be concerned about McConnell? I really don't think so. The polling shows he's in good shape. Uh, there are three other unknown candidates besides McConnell running in, in addition to that. So when you have four candidates, even though all four are basically unknown candidates, it's tough to win without a runoff, although I think he may very well do that tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> what does it say, though, when there are four other people running on the Republican side to try and get a, uh, to get his seat? Well, you know, a lot of times people just run to get acquainted. You know, that may be what some of them are doing. Uh, they may have, you know, felt like it's good to get some statewide exposure, although I think the only one who got any exposure was McConnell, you know, the only one who had a little money to spend. Uh, I'm not saying it's over, but polls I'm showing uh, that Shelby's done his homework and he'd probably be reelected. If he gets over 50 percent, that's an impressive victory mm -hmm. well, against four opponents. <clears throat> um, I mean, and, and just a little, can you speak to a little bit of just how seemingly, I don't know necessarily that it's nasty between McConnell and Shelby, but it has certainly gotten a little meaner, especially over the last month or two. Well, the presidential race has, too, on the Republican side. You know, this day and time, uh, the, the people lament negative advertising. They say, oh, I don't like negative advertising, but the, pr the problem is they work negative advertising works. Uh, they wouldn't use it if it didn't. Uh, these candidates employ public relations specialists who do nothing but campaigns. And for some reason, those public relations media consultants like to go negative, even if they don't have to. It's just something in the bread in them. They like to do negative ads. And so they've done opposition research, and they're going to hit somebody with some negative ads. Uh, it's just part of the system now. And um, I think that Shelby was running uh, to not get get uh, caught flat-footed is what he, I think he had plenty of campaign money. People have asked me around the state, why do you think Shelby spending so much money? Is he in trouble? I think the guy had $19 million in his campaign war chest. Why not spend six of it? You know, it's my six, six-year term. I've raised money to run. I do have opposition. I don't want to get caught and taking anything for granted. Yeah, I think so, too. Um, and then let's talk about... Uh, just what do you expect as far as voter turnout? You look at places like Nevada, especially in South Carolina, on the GOP side, they have had record-breaking voter turnout in their primaries and caucuses. Is, what do you see as far as turnout in Alabama? I see a record turnout. I, I think we're poised for a big turnout. This presidential race has been followed a lot by people. And the one thing that we have noticed throughout this campaign, or I've noticed, is that we are almost parallel with the rest of the country. Our polling numbers look identical to the rest of the country as far as the Trump, Rubio, Cruz thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, 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 it's almost like we'll, we're supposed to be this conservative enclave, and we are conservative. But the other thing is the, the quote, strictly evangelical vote has been clouded a little bit by this Trump phenomenon. Uh, polling is showing that a uh, third to half of people who identify themselves as evangelicals who voted for Huckabee eight years ago in Santorum four years ago in Alabama have been obscured by this Trump phenomenon. Hmm. And so, uh, you know, I don't see us being, when you, when you look at the numbers tomorrow night, you may see almost like well, which state's which. You know, you're going to see Georgia, Alabama, Arkansas, Tennessee, all with about the same numbers. I don't think we stand out like a sore thumb. Trump may get a point or two higher. The session endorsement may have bumped him a point or two. Uh, you know, we are a very conservative state. He may be flirting with 40 here. Mm -hmm. Polls showing him getting 40 in Tennessee, showing about 37 here. But the interesting thing about this race is we become not only participating in the national uh, general and the primary vote for Republican nomination, mm -hmm. but we're almost parallel to the, to the polling. <laughs> and I think our results will be that way. But I think a record turnout. One thing that <clears throat> voters need to be aware of when they walk in there tomorrow is they'll be deluged with a bunch of delegates they've got to choose from. Like if they vote for Cruz or Rubio or Trump, they will see a host of people running as delegates. You don't necessarily have to vote for a delegate. If you say, I don't know any of these people, you can vote for them or you can just not vote at all. Your vote for Rubio, Cruz, or Trump, or Hillary, or Sanders all counts for that delegate. <coughs> um, let me get a chance to clear your throat. Let me read this here. We had gotten an email, I think, about Amendment Number One to the Constitution. Um, 
authorizing retirement program for DAs and circuit clerks of the state who are first elected or appointed after November 8th. And I don't know the specifics on why I need to ask you about it, but I did. I, I, I have heard that some of the way that those amendments are worded can sometimes be confusing to voters. Have you heard, you know, as you're across the state, are people really working hard to try and understand what these amendments are so they can know which way to vote? Well, there's only one amendment. Okay. It's Amendment 1, and what that does is the circuit clerks and DAs have a very lucrative strange retirement system in Alabama. They don't pay into it and they get a very lucrative retirement. So this, uh, this does away with it. A yes vote puts them more in line, makes them contribute to their own retirement, and it puts them in line with other state employees. Okay. So, <coughs> yeah, and so as you read the amendment. It does here. away with their particular, the, with their particular uh, advantage they have. Mm -hmm. It does away with that. Okay. It, get, it get, puts them I mean, they've got a pretty sweetheart deal now. Right. So this amendment clears up that sweetheart deal that DAs and, and circuit clerks have where they pay nothing into the retirement system and they get a, almost the same as a judicial retirement system, which is extremely lucrative. Okay. The judicial retirement system in Alabama is very lucrative. Uh, if you're a young lawyer, it's, it's a good job to be a judge because the retirement is unbelievable. Okay. Uh, so going forward, that that a, a, okay. a yes vote on Amendment One does away with that sweetheart deal and puts the, the circuit clerks and DAs in the same boat with the other employees. And that was going to be my question to you. It's just that when you read the amendment, it basically just says that you're going to put them into a retirement program. Who are elect it doesn't necessarily spell out in that proposing of an amendment that. You know, th they'll go into a system where they pay, or they'll like is you know, yes is to take them out of the current system and into an, a different one. Yes is to take them out of their sweetheart deal, okay. where they pay nothing in and get a lucrative retirement. That's their current status. A yes vote on Amendment One does away with that and puts them back with other state employees. So if you vote yes on this, they, the system that they'll go into, they'll pay into their mm -hmm. own instead of just getting right. money. At the they end. go okay. into the same system with like teachers and right. stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right now they've got a sweetheart deal they got through the legislature years ago, maybe 18 years ago or something, and, and they got they don't pay anything in. <laughs> and they get, I mean, and plus, yeah. I, I think they're better than the teachers or the state employees. I think yeah. they're actually getting judicial retirement. Oh, wow. At least judges pay into it. But yeah. the judicial retirement in Alabama is very, very a sweetheart deal. All right. I mean, you can serve 18 years and you get your full salary for life. Oh, wow. I need uh, but, to be a judge yeah. quickly before November. Going to law school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's it, Steve. Anything else? Yeah. That's covered. I'm glad we covered Amendment 1. Uh, okay. I don't see any surprises tomorrow. You think it'll... Uh, it'll we ought to touch on Hillary probably. Gonna, I did say Hillary's going to win. We did, yeah. Probably we 70. I think, it's, I think she gets 70, 75%. Yeah. 